Welcome back, everybody. This is the Social Brain. We're doing a uh, kind of special episode today. We've done one of these before, but we're doing an Ask Us Anything episode. So we put out some some comments uh, earlier in the in the week and last week, and got some some questions that rolled in. Uh, and so we've been kind of preparing answers for all of those ones, but we also highly encourage people to kind of throw some questions in the chat uh, if you if you want to, to know just more about what we're talking about or if you have something else that you want to know about. Just keep in mind, though, that uh, the depth of the question is going to have a lot of impact on whether or not we're able to answer it because we do put a bit of research into a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, but yeah, I'm Taylor Guthrie. I'm a social neuroscientist. I run the channel the Cellular Republic, and this is my awesome co-host Andrew Cooper Sanson. I'll kick it over to him. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, I run the channel Sense of Mind, and yeah. So today we are we're doing an Ask Me Anything. We've got some questions lined up that you guys asked us in the comments of a couple different posts we put out. And um, I guess just before we get into that, I just want to remind everybody that if you get anything out of this episode, please give it a like on both our channels, help, hopefully, but on at least one and, and subscribe. Um, that's really helpful to us. But um, I guess, yeah, do you want to, should we just jump into the first one? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So uh, our first question that we're going to tackle is something that uh, we've covered kind of uh, surface level a lot in a lot of our different episodes, but it really is about these, these different divisions of the brain. Um, there's a, a theory called the triune brain theory that's really popular in terms of like most average people talk about us having a reptilian brain and there's the mammalian brain or whatever. Um, and this question that we got was kind of in line with that. I want to know the difference between the limbic brain and the reptilian brain. Are they the same or do they operate differently? Um, and so we'll kind of kick it off. I think the first thing that we want to, to kind of preface is that the triune brain theory has actually been debunked for a while now. Uh, there are aspects to, to the theory that I think are still applicable, that we can still talk about in terms of the function of these different parts of the brain. Uh, but it's important to remember that the brain didn't evolve in these different steps. Like all of a sudden mammals got this whole different part of their brain and then humans and apes got this whole other different part of their brain or whatever. Uh, every single vertebrate back to the earliest kind of like worms that were swimming around in the ocean had every part of the brain that we have now. The difference was in how big those pieces of the brain were based on what they were doing in their environment most often. And you have simpler animals, reptiles, tend to spend more time just regulating bodily functions. And so the part of their brain that we call the reptilian brain uh, was a lot bigger in those animals. And then social animals, mammals, they tended to be a lot more engaged with emotion and regulation. And so you see the limbic area starting to get bigger in these animals. And then with humans, we're very cognitive. And so our cortex just kind of blew up and got huge. Um, but we'll we'll kind of dig into the, the functional aspects of these. So you want to kind of take a stab at it, Andrew? Yeah, sure. So just to kind of clarify um, what we're talking about when we say the reptilian brain, or you might hear it as like the lizard brain um, versus the limbic brain or the mammalian brain, and then that versus the, the primate or human brain or neocortex. Um, the idea is like, so I'll just, I'll show this picture, but I'll just describe what I'm saying. So, so the, the reptilian brain is kind of this down here, the brainstem and the, um, the cerebellum, and maybe a little bit more uh, superior to the the brainstem, like the, the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Um, and yeah, like Taylor said, these areas have to, a lot to do with just regulating bodily functions, um, kind of the fight or flight response to some extent, and um, the cerebellum especially involved in coordinating movement. But as you could see from that, that diagram that I just put up is it's, there's no real like division between any of them. I mean, there is, there, there are kind of modules, you know, anatomical pieces of the brain, but like Taylor was saying, this, this theory is, um, one of the problems with it is that you can just look at the brain and see, oh, well, these are just continuous structures and they're all connected and to kind of demarcate, oh, this is the reptilian brain. And then this is the mammalian brain, um, is a little bit arbitrary. But there are some some functional differences. So like lizard brain or reptilian brain having more to do with movement and um, and regulating bodily functions. 
And then the mammalian brain or the limbic brain, um, uh, or what, what McLean, the, the originator of this theory called the paleo mammalian complex, <laughs> um, is kind of what you might, uh, the, uh, the limbic system or like the basal ganglia combined with the amygdala and even the hippocampus. Um, so some of these regions that are a lot more involved in like emotion or um, arousal or at least like motivation and goal directed behavior. Yeah, um, I like to I like to really think about a lot of this stuff in terms of like the flow of information and like what really needs to be accomplished by the body, by the brain. Right. Because the brain is a it's a regulatory organ. It's trying to manage all of these really complex systems in the body. Right. And so first and foremost, if you're going to be a functional organism operating in the world, you need to first make sure that your heart is pumping. You need to make sure that your lungs are working and that blood is circulating and that uh, all of your muscles are, are getting energy. And uh, so that is the stuff that is is kind of housed in that first part, kind of basal part of the brain and the brainstem that that Andrew talked about. But if you can if you can manage that stuff, if you have that under control uh, and you have to think like reptilian they were cold blooded, right? And so they actually had to spend a lot more energy and like time and like figuring out where they needed to be to regulate these different things because of their their bodily kind of stuff that was going on. Uh, but then you you end up in this situation now where you kind of have that taken care of, but now you're also kind of a social animal as well. And there are different kind of states that you have to maintain. You're, there's different goals that you have to maintain in terms of, uh, having relationships with other people and these mammalian troops that you're a part of. Uh, and what I really like to think of in terms of the, the limbic system is that it's, it's really about like state changes. It's about kind of turning things up or turning things down in terms of a lot of the physiological stuff that's going on. You think about like fight or flight, rest and digest, all of these things. Uh, depending on the context that you're in, you may need to kind of ramp the system up or you may need to kind of turn the system down. Uh, and a lot of that emotional stuff, the, the kind of feelings, the mood states that we're in, are what really put us in those states of being, of being really kind of up and motivated to go out and get resources and do things and interact with other people in our troop. Uh, or it's systems that are like, I don't have enough energy. We need, to, we need to tone things down. We need to rest. We need to stop. We need to not be motivated to go out and do things. Um, and this is where you see a lot of these these really complex neurotransmitter systems, uh, the dopamine system, right? Uh, Andrew mentioned like basal ganglia. You have the ventral tegmental area that's kind of in this area that's all about kind of reward and motivated behavior. Um, and then you have the the kind of serotonergic system that's really about kind of monitoring the state of your body and whether you have the ability to kind of go out and get things, right? Uh, all of these are kind of working in concert to, to really... Uh, mediate the difference between what's going on in our outside environment and what's going on in our internal environment and how do we kind of manage the the intersection between those two because that's where the limbic system really sits is kind of at that intersection between kind of the external world and our internal state yeah i like that and um i guess to sort of complete the picture then the uh the next the third stage of evolution, uh, as, as it's seen in this triune brain theory is, um, like the neo, oops, the neocortex or the, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a strange, like, uh, def kind of arbitrary definition to say neocortex versus cerebral cortex that, because again, this is like a continuous structure, but I won't get, I won't get hung up on all these caveats and all this, these problems with the theory. Um, because there is there is something to this that like humans and higher primates and just higher mammals in general have this really highly developed cerebral cortex. And this comes in to kind of what Taylor was talking about as being an even more fine grain um, like regulator of the rest of the brain. So the, the limbic system and even the, the, the lizard brain, if you want to put it, think about it like that. <laughs> but I always like to emphasize that there is back and forth there's communication going back and forth between all these different areas of the brain. And, um, you know, even something as kind of, uh, 
as as complex as like human level intelligence is a result of not only the cerebral cortex, but its interaction with all these other systems in the brain. Um, so I think that's kind of the way to to think about the brain uh, more than just like we we have like these individual modules that that are like sort of the the plumbing and then like emotions <laughs> and then uh, intelligence. It's all kind of working together, but there are some generalizations to be made. And I like to think of uh, the cortex itself. Uh, there was a, a researcher that I really like, evolutionary researcher. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I feel really bad. But uh, he talked a lot about the, the cortex being like the, the analyzers, that they're really what are, are kind of picking apart the fine grained details of, of everything that we just talked about to, to really make sure that we're making the best decision. Um, and so you have to think about this flow of information, right? The body is kind of sending all of these signals as being regulated by the brainstem. The, the midbrain is kind of this intersection between kind of the outside world memory. And, uh, but it's, it's really not getting a clear picture of what's on the, in the outside world. It gets a really grainy picture of what's going on in the outside world. Um, and I've said this before on the, on the podcast before, but uh, it's like taking a picture on like a, a 90s flip phone, right? Uh, and then you have the, the cortex is really what is doing the work to, to make really clear pictures of what's going on. Um, and most of that was external stimuli. Uh, throughout evolution, right? We have these this visual cortex that pops up. Uh, so animals that are super visual are going to have large visual cortices that, uh, and like we're very visual species. Most of our sensory stuff is devoted to to vision. Um, but you have this this huge pipeline of information that is making uh, is finding all the lines and edges and putting them together and tracking motion and putting color into it and uh, really creating these fine these really fine grain perceptions like taking a, a picture on a super high def pic, uh, high def camera. But you have this with other senses too. And it really, when you think about kind of this from an evolutionary perspective, the size of these regions is very much determined by how much the animals are using a particular sense. And so if you have animals that are primary like smell oriented, they're going to have these huge olfactory cortices that are building really, really strong perceptions of different types of smells or different types of sounds. You have blind animals that have these really robust auditory cortices that build really high perceptions of sound, right? And most of what that's doing is it's allowing a clearer picture to then kind of top down regulate all of that stuff that's going on. So you have these, these bodily things that are going on. You have this interaction with the outside world that is then convincing us that we maybe need to change our state, right? Go into fight or flight, go into rest or digest, right? But a lot of that is, is happening on a really quick time scale. This is where like the amygdala gets information really quickly. And it's really getting that that fine that that uh, not fine grain picture. It's getting this really fuzzy picture of what's out there. And so it's like, oh my gosh, that's so scary! And puts the whole body because it's right there above the brainstem, right? It's able to immediately talk to all these physiological regions and say, we need to get into fight or flight. We need to kick things up. We need to get going. Uh, you think about anxiety. A lot of the things that you experience where you don't like cognitively like thinking about it, you don't really see any type of a threat but your body is interpreting that threat. And it's putting your entire, because it has that communication directly to the brainstem, it's putting you into that, that cortisol dump. It's taking energy away from your stomach and sending it to your muscles, your heart's beating, all of these things. And then it takes a while for your cortex to then kind of make this really, this really nice picture. And to say like, oh, you know what? Like maybe me getting in a fight with my spouse isn't me dying. Right. Uh, but I'm not really at, at, at this like threat. And so uh, maybe we can like calm the body down. Right. And so it's these back and forth communications that Andrew was talking about that really make all of that possible. Yeah. And um, and kind of one part of the. Uh, well, there's there's sort of this debate in like the, the neuroscience of emotions about whether the cortex is necessary for kind of our experience of emotions. And um, we've talked about that before on this channel, on our, our on this show, but, um, but there is, uh, there's some interesting things about what, how the cortex kind of interacts with these other regions of the brain where 
you might have regions involved in like motivated behavior and pleasure and um, and like what Taylor was just talking about arousal, but then you have the cortex kind of regulating and and uh, and sort of fleshing out that feeling or behavior. Um, and then uh, making it more fine grain. And I guess I'm, I'm talking about that as a way to uh, sort of clumsily transition us into the next question, um, <laughs> which is- It uh, is really has, related. Yeah, <laughs> which has to do with um, this uh, liking and, and wanting uh, circuitry. So the question is, can you discuss the interplay between the desire circuitry and pleasure circuits? Is there an overlap? Could you discuss the nuclei? What circuits act in opposition to these? So um, just as like a, a quick introduction to what this person is asking about is um, when they're talking about wanting or pleasure or uh, motivation versus pleasure, um, this kind of comes to this uh, this theory or this, this model of how um, pleasure and positive affect and positive emotions work from the neuroscientists uh, Morton Kringlebach and uh, Kent Barrage, who I seem to mention in every single episode of this show, um, but uh, that th they saw wanting and liking as kind of these two core components of the reward process. So wanting being what they called um, incentive salience or kind of a, a motivational drive that, that um, sort of kicks the organism into action to get things that it in its environment to, or to escape from things, even um, to go towards things. And then the, the liking circuitry having to do with pleasure being kind of the, the actual hedonic aspect of that reward. And the reason that this person's mentioning this circuitry, these different circuits is because wanting and liking are separable in the brain. So there's different um, different circuitry, different networks that are involved in wanting on the one hand and liking on the other. And um, to, to go into this a little bit, um, the, the liking circuitry is, is interesting because it is associated with these things called hedonic hotspots. So they're these really small regions of the brain. They're thought to be about one cubic millimeter in volume. So that's, that's very tiny. Um, and when they're activated and they, they tend to be stimulated by uh, neurotransmitters like um, opioids or endocannabinoids. And so these are, these are associated with pleasure. And when they activate these regions, um, these hedonic hotspots, they're not sure exactly how many there are, but there's at least several. And they, tend to recruit each other. They tend to activate in a network fashion. So when one activates, it tends to recruit the others. Um, and I'm going into this because this, this questioner asked yeah. about it, but I promise there'll be, there'll be a payoff. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll just go into a few of these. What, um, so there's, there are kind of, this comes back to this idea of the cortex versus the sort of lower brain regions, the subcortical regions. Um, so there's a what they call the core or subcortical hotspot network. And this uh, includes regions like the nucleus accumbens, um, specifically the medial shell near the, the center of the nucleus accumbens, um, and the ventral pallidum, and then an area in the brainstem called the pontine uh, parabrachial nucleus. And um, so in the, the ventral pallidum, which is located near like the hypothalamus, if people want to know, um, this one is important because it seems to be the only region that is, or the only hedonic uh, hotspot that's actually necessary for pleasure to occur. So if this region is destroyed, like or lesioned in a mouse brain, um, it seems to... Um, uh, completely eliminate the, the liking reactions. So the, the animals like facial expressions in response to um, sweet uh, food, and then it will replace that with like a disgust reaction. So I'm going into these, these specific uh, regions because it was asked, but I, I find it really interesting because then you have the cortical hotspots, the, the regions in the cortex, 
And these are uh, specifically in the orbital frontal cortex and the insular cortex. So areas near the front of the brain, kind of in the, in the frontal lobe, the orbital frontal cortex is so right behind the orbits of the eyes on the, the underside of, of where the, the brain curls over, kind of a general, um, general description of that. Um, but one, one cool thing about this area is it seems to be involved in, in processing the, the, the sort of sensory aspects of pleasure that are transmitted by the subcortical regions. So um, this goes back to what Taylor was saying about having a more, the, the cortex being more involved in like a fine grain perception or fine grain processing of the data that's coming from the subcortical regions. And I promise I'm, I'm getting to the end of this, but the, uh, <laughs> the, the orbital frontal cortex has this really cool thing. It's called a, they call it an abstractness to concreteness gradient. And um, so it, near areas more near the front of the, the orbital frontal cortex, activate more in response to more abstract or complex kinds of rewards or reinforcers or sources of pleasure. So like monetary rewards or social uh, rewards, whereas the, the, uh, more, um, the areas more near the back are more involved in like concrete, just purely sensory pleasures like um, food or sex, things like that. Um, and so there's there's this interesting interaction in this this from the subcortical hotspots to the cortical hotspots and they're sort of the like evaluation centers um, and and uh, the wanting circuitry is more um, centered in like the the basal ganglia, but the, the ventral tegmental area specifically. And the big difference with these regions, they actually overlap with some of the hedonic hotspots, but the difference is that they activate in response to dopamine stimulation. So when, when dopamine is there, the wanting circuitry tends, tends to kick into gear uh, versus in the liking or hedonic hotspot circuitry, it's endocannabinoids and opioids. And, um, yeah, I could probably keep going, but I'll, I'll stop there for a second. No, no, there's a, there's a couple things that I want to kind of highlight that you just said. Uh, first thing that I want to highlight is what you said about being like a cubic millimeter is that what you said. Some of these, these hotspots are tiny. And to put that in perspective, when or we cubic do centimeter, sorry, cubic, cubic centimeter, when we do a, uh, like a, a neuroimaging type study, we're, our smallest unit of measurement is a two by two by two millimeter cube, right? Uh, and so we're like, these these things are, are really, really small that are giving us our sense of, of like overwhelming pleasure. But the wanting system that Andrew was just getting into is actually huge. Like this is like one of the biggest systems in the brain. And it really kind of highlights this idea, uh, I think, Kent Barrage was one of the people that said this in one of his papers that uh, it's no surprise then that we, when we think back on our lives, have so many more instances of desire than we do of pleasure, right? That our, our instances of pleasure are usually short lived compared to our overwhelming like seeking and trying to find things and uh right and it's it's the whole like the buddhist like the the journey is is better than the destination right it's mm -hmm. kind of trying to get you to to reconfigure these things in a way uh but the other thing that really stood out to me too was uh something that i i didn't know until you just said andrew was the the necessary uh nuclei for pleasure um, and it kind of ties into something that I, I came across recently. I've been doing some uh, some research into the treatment of depression and the history of the treatment of depression and things like that. Um, and some of these really reductionist views of depression were, you know, the, the cortex is having too many sad thoughts, too many abstract sad thoughts, and it's convincing the rest of the brain to be really sad. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to go in and we're going to do a singulotomy. So we're going to cut the, the cortex we're going to cut its ability to talk to the rest of the brain. And what you end up with is like, you, you don't really have, like it does reduce depression symptoms when you do that. And the idea was that like, we're cutting off the ability to experience abstract pain. But the other side of it is that you're also cutting off the ability to have abstract pleasure. And this whole thing, like all of these hedonic hotspots 
having these communications with one another, right? So like Andrew was saying, like when one hotspot is active, it's recruiting the other ones. Like, should we be feeling pleasure right now? Like, yeah, yeah. Abstractly, this is great, right? Uh, but then all of it needs to kind of be connected back to this other one that's like necessary for the overall feeling of pleasure. And if you're cutting off the ability of like this hot spot in the cortex to have communication with the other pieces that are responsible for giving you the feeling of pleasure, then you can't really, then you just become numb. You can't have any of these abstract feelings of pleasure or of pain or anything like that. Uh, these are, these are really interesting systems. And I think it's important. We've, we've talked about this on our episode about addiction. That's where Kent Barrage comes up a lot and that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is kind of a, a newer idea because for a long time, people that were studying dopamine, that were studying kind of the pleasure pathway, uh, were actually thinking that wanting and liking were the same thing, that, uh, that dopamine was pleasure. Um, and it wasn't until, I mean, the reason Kent Barrage gets brought up so much on this episode, or I mean, on these episodes and these podcasts is because he truly was a pioneer in going against the grain because so many, re I mean, hundreds of researchers were on the dopamine pleasure train that like, this is what it is. And it's this example of confirmatory bias that if, if that's what you believe that it is, and you're running these experiments, you're convincing yourself that what you're seeing is that that like the rat pushes the lever because it's feeling pleasure because it's stimulating these dopamine areas in the brain but when you really kind of tease these things apart you do notice that liking is different than wanting and that that pushing the lever is actually kicking up a feeling of desire rather than a feeling of pleasure the reason it keeps hitting it is because it's like i i want what's at the end of that and i'm not getting to it <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And well, and to be fair too, there is a pretty, usually a pretty close correspondence between wanting and liking. And there were some studies like uh, electro electrical stimulation, uh, direct electrical stimulation of the brain in, in humans, where I think they were, they were stimulating some of these regions I was just talking about and people would describe it as pleasure. But again, that's because they're, they weren't doing it in the way that I was just talking about where there's this neuro, the difference in the neurotransmitters. So there's the, the liking system is more associated with endocannabinoids and opioids and the wanting system more with dopamine. But when you stimulate that, that, you know, cubic centimeter of space, uh, yeah, you're going to get like a, something that's not a really natural reaction, but, um, but also, yeah, just the, the fact that, that uh, wanting and liking do their circuitry does overlap. Um, there is, you know, I could see, I can see why that, that became the belief for a while. And then actually um, to be fair, even before Barrage had, had done a lot of this, um, there are people like Yak Pongsep who was studying what he called the seeking system, which is basically the wanting system or the, the system involved in motivation or uh, yeah, incentive salience, motivation. Um, and so there was some hints to this, that there was, there was kind of a dedicated motivational system. And then, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. That confirmation bias definitely hampered the field for a while. Well, and it makes sense when you really think about the fact that these systems are overlapping there's there's a reason for that, right? Because if we're seeking something, then we want to feel pleasure when we found what we're seeking, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? And so there's got to be this really intimate connection and this overlap with these systems because it is the reward at the end of the, the tunnel or whatever it is. So, yeah. Um, cool. Did you have anything else you wanted to say on that one or do you want to go to the um, next one? Maybe? There's a lot, like, but no. Yeah. Let's... I mean, you can, we can talk a little <laughs> bit more about it if you want to. Um, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I guess I just wanted to read this quote uh, from Barrage and yep. Kringlebach about kind of what we were just talking about with the um, the recruitment of the various hedonic hotspots in that that sort of uh, network way where they they recruit each other, and they they talk about it in this really like interesting sort of metaphorical way. They say, uh, "quote At the highest levels, the hotspot network may function as a more democratic hierarchy." in which unanim unanimity of positive votes across hotspots is required in order to generate greater pleasure. For example, any successful enhancement that starts in one hotspot 
involves recruiting neuronal activation across other hotspots simultaneously to create a network of several that all vote yes together for more pleasure. Conversely, a pleasure enhancement initiated by opioid activation of one hotspot can be vetoed by an opposite vote of no from another hotspot where opioid signals are suppressed. Oh, I just I just like that, that metaphor. Yeah, especially given no. Taylor's cellular republic. <laughs> <laughs> right. We we have this brain that's that's democratic in a way. I uh, uh, it's interesting because there is kind of representation when you really think about how the brain works uh, is that you you have all of these nerves that go all throughout your body and when you're making any kind of a decision there is some type of representation of all of these different parts of our body and saying like do we have the ability to do this that we're making a decision about does this feel good is this okay and like i like to think of the the brain as being this kind of this, this Greek forum where you have like all of these senators that are all like standing around and you have like the foot senator and you have the heart senator and like all of these these people that that represent different parts of our physiology uh, and different types of information that are all represented in different parts of the brain. Um, and there's kind of this cacophony in our brain of everyone vying for some type of a vote over our overall behavior. Um, and if everything is going good, then the senator is not speaking very loud, right? My, my foot feels fine. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not aware of it. But if all of a sudden I stub my toe, that senator is like, hey, we need to focus on this thing down here, right? Um, and it's the same thing with all of this pleasure stuff that he was just talking about, where you have different parts of the brain are, are responsible for evaluating different elements of pleasure. Um, and the the really interesting thing that, that Andrew got into is that kind of concrete abstract gradient that you have in in the frontal lobe in general it's uh, orbital frontal cortex is what we're specifically talking about now uh but we've evolved in this way that we ex the the frontal cortex expanded out and as it expanded out it was creating more and more abstract ideas right you start with this really like what you can see what you can touch what you can feel but then you end with a concept of justice with like <laughs> fairness and and belief and all of these things which um which then have some some sort of say in that democratic process of whether or not i should be feeling pleasure right if you if these other areas are like yes but then this other one's like what are we, are we laughing at someone getting hurt? Like this abstract feeling of fairness, of justice? Like, no, we, we shouldn't be feeling pleasure right now. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to kind of think about it in these kind of metaphorical ways. Yeah, definitely is. And I, I guess I just realized I, I we need to, one, there was one last part of the question that was what circuits act in opposition to these mm. circuits. And uh, so there, interestingly, um, I mean, with with wanting, when it comes to that uh, sort of desire, um, incentive salience, like the the uh, drive to go toward something, um, there is this really interesting quote where Berge and Kringlebach talk about the nucleus accumbens as being a an emotional keyboard, and they talk about where there the one side of it. I think it's. I don't want to mess this up. I think it's the front, uh, yeah, the the front part of it, um, of the medial shell of the nucleus accumbens, when it is stimulated by dopamine, um, elicits these approach behaviors that we're talking about. But if you stimulate areas near the back, it does the opposite. It elicits aversive behaviors, like either attack or running away. Um, so they kind of think of this as um, the interaction between desire and dread in this one region. And interestingly, like if you stimulate the middle of that medial shell, uh, you get context dependent responses. So if the, the animal's in a safe, uh, positive context and that area is stimulated, it'll be more likely to show an approach type behavior going towards something um, versus if, if it's in like a negative or dangerous sort of context, uh, it'll elicit these kind of aversive behaviors. So I guess that's, I don't know if that's necessarily um, directly addressing that question, but I think it, uh, at least on the sort of wanting and incentive salient side, it definitely has something to do with uh, these circuits working in, 
in opposition to each other. Um, there's there's a lot to this uh, this literature that it would be hard to get into right now, but in general, something like the prefrontal cortex, um, the prefrontal cortex uh, kind of is a general regulator of a lot of the brain, or at least cognitive control networks in general um, that are kind of centered on the PFC. Um, so this, you know, like we we're just talking about, the orbital frontal cortex is evaluating the activity of the hedonic hotspots, and there can be kind of top-down regulation coming from there. So you could see that as kind of these circuits working in opposition. Um, but yeah. This is this is purely speculative, speculative, but something I've I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, the interplay between serotonin and dopamine, uh, and this is this is again this is something that I've kind of kind of been thinking about, and uh, but when you look at a lot of what serotonin is associated with in terms of in terms of mood in terms of aggression in terms of like uh, compulsion and obsessive behaviors and rumination uh you look at the treatment of depression which is uh, around kind of serotonergic type systems uh when you look back evolutionarily uh serotonin and dopamine are incredibly ancient neurotransmitters like they are present in single celled organisms right uh, and dopamine tends to be tied to these seeking type behaviors, these these motivated, I need to go out in the world and get things type behaviors. And when you look in a single cell, uh, low dopamine means I need to go out and find things, whereas high dopamine is I just found something I need to stay here and exploit. I need to eat what I have. But once you've run out of it, then dopamine starts getting low and it's like, oh, you need to go out and you need to explore more. But serotonin was more about the internal state of the cell. It was monitoring energy and resources and kind of how things were going. And uh, when you really think about it, and a lot of the work we've talked about this before in terms of like learned helplessness and the, the work by Martin Seligman and Stephen Meyer uh, around like the dorsal raphe nucleus and the serotonergic system being really tied to these ideas of control, of having control over my environment. Do I have control over my environment? Um, and I've started to think of like the serotonergic system kind of being in opposition to the dopaminergic system. Uh, and they can be in tandem with each other and they can help each other. But in the cases of something like depression, I see it as this thing where serotonin is taking this, this internal kind of it's got these these ties to memory. It's got these ties to kind of the the body. Like a ton of our serotonergic stuff is in the gut, so it's monitoring like how much energy, how many resources we have. But serotonin is this this key of like, do I have the ability to go out and get the things that dopamine is motivating me to go get, right? So you have these these urges like I need to go accomplish something I need to go to work I need to do these things or whatever uh, but then you maybe have these serotonergic systems that are like I don't have the ability to do that I don't have the skills to do that look at all these times that I failed I'm tied up to memory like no I can't go do those things and so you end up with psychomotor retardation you're not able to move you're not able to get out right uh, and like the treatment of depression is about kind of bringing these serotonergic systems up and activating them more and things like that. Uh, and so again, this is this is kind of my kind of idea around all of this as I've interacted. I'm, I'm doing a, a psychopharmacology class right now and thinking about how all of these things interact. But I do see this this interesting interplay between these these seeking dopaminergic systems and these more kind of here and now like state of the organism type systems like serotonin. Um, we got this. Uh, we got this interesting question in the chat, which is actually kind of a fun question. Uh, if you could travel on the magic school bus to any part of the brain, where would you go and why? What do you think, Andrew? I don't know. Um... <laughs> Hop on the magic school bus. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I have to think about that for a second. Do you have an answer off the top of your head? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm biased. I mean, I my favorite part of the brain is the the medial prefrontal cortex and uh, understanding the role that it has in our identity, our sense of self. Uh, but I have this kind of this this fantasy, this picture of like like who you got to pick someone in the class, right? Uh, I don't remember all their names. Maybe like Arthur, the guy with glasses. Like we're gonna go into his brain and see what's going on and uh, go into someone's ear. But like going on a tour would be really cool to see the flow of information. 
right? Maybe yeah. like starting, like we talked about starting the show, talking about the flow of information up from the body and then up into these limbic systems, producing these, these like feelings of, of motivation and of, uh, of desire. And, and then that kind of translating out into these, these cortical regions and like following the, the visual stuff uh, and eventually getting to the, the area in like the frontal cortex and seeing like, like look at this whole network of, of neurons that are all communicating with each other. And that, that whole pattern of electricity is the idea of justice or is the idea of who you are and your narrative about like all of the memories that you had. And look, there's your memories. They're playing right there and they're being <laughs> kind of tied into our idea of value. And, uh, it's just, it's a cool idea to, to think about being able to, to kind of see these things in this kind of metaphorical way. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it is just a bunch of electric, electrical and chemical activity. But when you like think about our phenomenological experience, that activity is something. It is who we are. It is our beliefs, our values, all of these things. And to be able to, to see that in this abstract way would be really interesting. But yeah, that's a good one. That's definitely good. Um, I think you cheated a little bit though, because you said you're just gonna flow through the information, <laughs> flow of the brain. And um, I, I think the the hippocampus might be one that would be really cool to see because if it if it really is kind of a storage or um, reactivator of memories, so to speak, it would be very interesting to see how that actually happens and how, how our brains uh, trigger like kind of the recollection of memories in that region. That's a good question. When I first read it, I thought it was just, I thought it was, uh, if you could travel on the magic school bus to anywhere in the world, where would you go? <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so, no, uh, we got, we got Mrs. We got Mrs. Frizzle. She's taken us on a ride. Oh yeah. Mrs. Frizzle. <laughs> Man, I hope people know what we're talking about. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, should we go to the next question? Yeah, yeah. So okay. about to go on a 10-day Vipassana meditation silent retreat. Was wondering what the likely effects are of spending 10 days meditating and making the most of it. Okay. Um, well, we've, we have an episode on mindfulness and meditation where we talked about uh, some of the changes that occur to kind of uh, really experienced meditation practitioners. Um, but there's some, there's some findings that I guess are relevant, like um, one study uh, by Zidane et al. Uh, 2010 found that after only four days of meditation mm -hmm. training, uh, novice practitioners, so I don't know if this person is a novice or going into this uh, having practiced, but um, mm -hmm. they showed significantly significant decreases in fatigue and anxiety and a uh, greater increase in you know, uh, mindfulness, which you might expect, um, mm -hmm. compared to controls. Uh, generally, I think a lot of the findings have to do with like emotion regulation and uh, enhancing um, on at least on the behavioral level. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look into these. Do you have anything to say on that? Is no, no. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, and this is a really interesting idea. It's, it's hard to narrow down exactly what's going on because, uh, we're not able, you have to think about how these things are studied, right? You have people that go on these retreats, uh, and then maybe they come back and they sit in a scanner and you, you have someone go before you have someone go after, uh, but these are usually really small samples of people that are doing this. It's hard to really say with any certainty what exactly is happening in that 10 days. But we do have a lot of data on people that have done hours and hours, like 10,000 hours meditating um, and have looked at kind of structural changes in their brain. You have increased cortical thickness in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is really responsible for kind of controlling and maintaining attention. Uh, we've seen kind of increases in cortical thickness in the insula, which is really responsible for understanding and feeling our internal state. Uh, something that I like to think about a lot in terms of something like a silent 10 day retreat that's really interesting is that we live in a, an incredibly chaotic world, right? Super busy. I have this book that my three-year-old reads. It's uh, the busy world or whatever, the busy town and everybody's busy. And they're doing things that are so busy. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's most of our lives is that we have so many uh, responsibilities. I, I, I do, I teach a, a group dynamics class. I think a lot about 
uh, so much of our attention goes to maintaining our relationships in our lives, uh, making sure that we're a good employee, that we're a good uh, family member, that we're a good spouse, whatever that, that may be, that we're, we're putting so much of our, our resources into maintaining our connection to the external world and to maintaining the connection to the things that identify us, to that who we kind of say we are. I'm a... I'm a scientist, I'm a, I'm a nurse, I'm a whatever, right? Uh, taking on those labels comes with a lot of responsibility. It comes with having to constantly put our attention and our resources and everything into maintaining that part of our life where we in all of that have really lost a lot of what I think the brain is responsible for. And the responsibility of the brain is to take care of the body, is to understand the body and understand the body's needs. And to go into a 10-day silent retreat, you're turning all of that external stuff off and you're giving your brain a chance to actually listen to the body. Um, I mentioned earlier this whole idea of the brain being this kind of representative government in a way. Uh, what you're doing in that 10-day silent retreat is actually giving each of those senators a voice is you're, you're going, not just listening to the senator, but maybe going on a tour with that senator down to the foot, down to the heart, down to the lungs, and actually like spending some time with the people down there, with the cells down there, and like listening to them, uh, trying to understand them. And what's really cool about the human brain is that we have the insular cortex, uh, which is really heavily expanded in the human species, even compared to our closest relatives with the, the chimpanzees, the bonobos and all of them. And what the insular cortex is really responsible for is our, our feeling of interoception. We have an entire episode on this, but our ability to actually listen to our body, to have some type of connection to how we feel. And if you kind of think back to all of these things that we just talked about at the beginning of this episode with the reptilian brain and the limbic system and all of these things is that you are spending this cortical time actually analyzing all of that stuff instead of being just kind of motivated by it you're actually listening to it and listening to it gives you the regulatory power over those emotions that's what andrew kind of hinted at is that so much of meditation is learning how to regulate but learning how to regulate is first learning how to listen how to sit and turn off the judgment Right. Because so much of what meditation does is it turns down the default mode network. Uh, we have a whole episode on the default mode network. So you want to listen to that one. Um, but the default mode network kind of tying back into how I started this answer was all of these different things that we're thinking about that are external, especially our social lives, all of these relationships that we're maintaining. And you think of whenever you stop what you're doing. If, when you stop engaging with some kind of a task that you're doing and you're just sitting there and you're just in your own head, you're getting flooded with thoughts, right? That's like a lot of meditation. If you go back and listen to our meditation episode, I mean, these, we're not creating a lot of the thoughts that, that we have. They're, they're kind of arising from our needs. They're arising from the brain trying to work out all of these different puzzles that we're engaged in on a daily basis on how to maintain these relationships, how to be a good employee, how to be a good spouse, all of these things. And did I take out the trash or not? Did I, I that fight, it just wasn't my fault. And you have all of these things that are just running and running and running. And, and what really happens when you meditate is that you're turning all of that down. Because a lot of what that system is responsible for is making judgments, making value judgments on how important these things are, uh, how it's tied to our sense of identity and all of these things. And when you turn that down, you're experiencing the outside world as it is without top down influence, without thinking about what it is about this relationship, about these things, about all of these things that are important to me. Instead, you're just experiencing them. You're just letting the senses come from the bottom up and you're just feeling them and you're just listening to them. Um, and so in terms of like what to expect from a 10 day retreat, I think going in with the plan to listen instead of just like, like, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to sit there and see what happens. But like having some type of kind of goal of like, I'm, I'm really going to learn what my body needs, what my body wants, what it says, how to communicate with it. The body doesn't speak English. The body sends feelings, it sends sensations, and it's only in that time that we spend with it that we start to be able to understand the language that our body is using. I know that was a really long-winded no, answer. No, that's but. perfect. <laughs> I was just going to say, because you're talking about, you know, this listening and this sort of greater, like, almost communication between 
brain regions. And one of the interesting findings is that um, experienced meditation practitioners show higher connectivity between cerebral hemispheres, specifically between uh, the prefrontal, like the, the uh, prefrontal lobes, basically prefrontal cortices. Um, and they think that that in greater uh, connectivity between those regions may help to explain this greater emotional regulation ability. So you're having this, you know, uh, better communication between these regions that are so centrally involved in regulating not only emotions, but behavior. And um, yeah, so I love that metaphor, like the way you're talking about <laughs> that. Um, and yeah, and, and uh, yeah, actually one of the findings too is that, uh, Basically, people, um, experienced meditation practitioners show this greater, uh, when they're thinking about themselves, when they're having this self-related processing, um, it's more about present moment stuff. So about this like interoceptive um, stuff, we're talking about bodily feelings, um, but what's happening in the moment. And then whereas like mind wandering and rumination and sort of narrative self-talk are more common with people who are less experienced in meditation or have lower dispositional mindfulness. It gets back to the, the William James kind of idea of identity, that there's these separable parts of identity. There's like the I and the me. There's the, the right now ph ph phenomenological experience of, of being an agent out in the world. And that's really what mindfulness taps into is like what did it what it feels like to be a living organism right now in this moment. Whereas the me component of identity is really more about how I fit into this kind of social fabric, this structure that I'm a part of that requires that I have some type of narrative that explains where I came from and where I'm going and have all of these goals and these ambitions and and that is it's really great that we have the ability to create that as humans uh but it also a, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind uh that the more time we spend in this ruminative kind of place uh the more unhappy we tend to be and so you really need to find that balance and doing these types of retreats and things like that can lead to more what andrew was talking about in terms of dispositional uh mindfulness that you're just on a, an average basis, you're spending more time away from these kind of default ruminative states and you're spending more time kind of experiencing the moment as it is. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of maximizing that engagement with the present moment is really beneficial. So I would assume that your 10 day retreat, uh, Vipassana <laughs> retreat will go, uh, will, will be beneficial for your emotional regulation and your <laughs> self-related processing. <laughs> Uh, we got this awesome uh, question in the in the chat from Jake Kawa. I just got here. What's a good way to self study neuroscience as someone with a rough and patchy academic background? First place you can start is coming to my channel because I have an entire <laughs> college course. <laughs> uh, so I, I taught uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, at the senior level, university level. Uh, I'm not going to say the university because I'm not affiliated with it, with this podcast or whatever. Uh, but I edited out all of the, the student questions to de-identify everything. And it's it's the full course that people spent thousands of dollars to come and take uh, that I put online for free. That's how I got started on YouTube, honestly. Um, and then met this guy randomly through YouTube. Yeah. Uh, and then we got together and started doing this this really cool stuff. But um, that's a, that's a great place to start is uh, I get into a lot of the nitty gritty of how, uh, so it's a cognitive neuroscience course. So a lot of it is focused on like human cognition on how we know from brain imaging studies and things like that, how these different, uh, concepts work like decision-making and, uh, cognitive control and perception and sense and all of these things. Uh, and then what we really try to do in, in this show is to kind of abstract away from that and try to talk about how that then applies to our daily life and how we kind of experience the things that we do. Yeah. So watch our channels, but, um, also <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew's got a ton of explainer videos on his channel too, that are awesome. I have, yeah, I've got some, and I, I mean, I do, I hear what you're saying about having a, a patchy, um, background. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, start with Taylor's courses, his cognitive neuroscience course, uh, that's just, I think that's like such a great way to get into learning about neuroscience. Um, and in our last AMA, we actually talked about different books and, and stuff that we have found really valuable. Um, 
I guess it does depend on how deep you want to go into this. Um, mm -hmm. If you want uh, a full on introduction to um, sort of the, the just like overview of the entire field of neuroscience, um, the, the best or one of the best textbooks is Principles of Neural Science uh, by Kendall and others. Um, but that is, you know, textbooks are expensive. So I, if you want um, to look into like some popular books, uh, we talked about a couple on the show, um, Behave by Robert Sapolsky. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. book provides, a, you know, I personally, like there's, there's parts of it near the end when he starts <laughs> talking about more like social issues and political stuff that I don't fully endorse everything he says, but <laughs> but he is an amazing communicator. He also has a lot of free lectures online on YouTube, Robert Sapolsky. Um, but yeah, his book, I think, is like such a great place to start. And I've talked to multiple neuroscientists who have recommended it as like a good place to start for the yeah. for someone who, as you say, has a patchy academic background. So we have this this other question, uh, and I don't think we're going to get to all of them uh, today. We're going to save some of these questions that we haven't gotten to for uh, for future episodes. But uh, the next one we were looking at is is really tied into what we were just talking about in terms of uh, mindfulness, meditation, and all these kind of things. And it was, why do I have intrusive thoughts? Uh, this is something that a lot of people suffer from. Uh, this is a hallmark of depressive symptoms, of anxiety, of these these racing thoughts and everything. OCD. Um, yeah, OCD, all of this. Uh, and like I said earlier, a lot of the thoughts that we have, like if you if you do kind of take a moment to, to be mindful, to practice, like er, novices that are starting meditation are the first thing that you learn is that you're going to be flooded with thoughts and that you need to become observant of them, that you need to see thoughts as things that are just kind of arising in awareness. But when you really think about that, it's a really interesting concept, right? That we as like a, if we have free will or whatever, uh, we're not actually creating those with our conscious kind of ability, right? A lot of these things are arising to consciousness. And the way that I really like to think about it is that the brain itself is trying to achieve needs. Like that's, that's kind of its, its overall purpose is to identify and resolve needs. And a lot of our intrusive thoughts come from unresolved needs in our environment in like having, so you have to think a lot about like, so if you've ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Um, not going to get into the nitty gritties, but you have your physiological needs, right? You have to have food, you have to have water, you have to have safety, you have to have shelter, uh, you have to have sex, <laughs> right? There are these things that you're that we're driven to just on, on the physiological basis. But we as humans also have the ability to create psychological needs. And this is what really makes us incredibly unique in the animal world is that um, and I mean, other animals do have like social needs as well, but we are able to kind of create these really abstract representations of those social needs. Um, and I think that is a big driver of a lot of the intrusive thoughts that people have is not feeling like they're accepted by the people around them. Right. And now you have this tension that like, I, I don't feel like these people like me, like they accept me, like they treat me like I'm part of the group, part of the in-group or whatever. And if that is unresolved, your brain is going to constantly try to think of how to resolve it. And is going to just create thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. Uh, there's other needs around just recognition. Do people see the hard work that I'm doing? Do they, do they see who I am? Do they know me for me and not me for the title that I have at the job that I'm at? And now your brain is thinking thoughts and thoughts of how to resolve these things. Because you have, I like to think of it like a thermostat, right? A thermostat is set at 72 degrees. And when it goes out of that range, it has to try to figure out how to change its behavior to get things back into equilibrium. But we have these thermostats that are social that are trying to maintain this kind of equilibrium of, are we accepted? Are we recognized? Are we part of something? Do I feel like I'm accomplishing what I need to accomplish? Uh, and the more we spend in these psychological needs and the more we create them psychologically, the more we're gonna have these thermostats that are off, that are causing our brain to try to think of ways to solve these things. 
Um, and one of the ways to solve this is to recontextualize a lot of this stuff. That's what cognitive behavioral therapy is all about, is thinking about what are these thoughts that I'm having that are intrusive? Where are they coming from? What are these unresolved needs? And how can I recontextualize the way that these, these needs are framed in my brain? Do I really need that acceptance from those other people? Do I really need that connection? Do I need that recognition, right? Um, and that's what helps to, to kind of stop them because you're convincing yourself psychologically because there's psychological needs that they are fulfilled. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that. I like that way of thinking about it. And I was just going to tack on to that, like the the network architecture of the brain that we have this network that we call the default mode network because it seems to uh, pop up. It seems to in, increase its activity when we are just our minds are wandering when we're not really doing anything. And so it's called this default mode because it seems to just be sort of the the background activity of the brain when we're not involved in any sort of task outside of ourselves. And um, so I would just kind of posit that um, what part of the reason you have these intrusive thoughts is because this network is so naturally just going to activate when you're not doing anything in particular. And then talk uh, feeding into what Taylor was just saying, where, you know, it's it's kind of it's like telling you the story of your life. And then um, that's where. I mean, that's probably where a lot of these thoughts are happening or being processed or <laughs> arising. Um, so that may be one reason. But um, there is a there is a whole literature on intrusive thoughts, especially as they relate to OCD. So on the more kind of pathological side of this, um, I guess I don't have that much to say about it. But uh, I guess <laughs> yeah, it depends on what what you mean by intrusive thoughts, really. No, and it's this has been something I've, I've thought about a lot. Is, I mentioned earlier this kind of speculative conception that I have of like serotonin and dopamine and things like that. Uh, we have these urges to go out and accomplish things, but then we also have this 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 system inside of us too that's trying to monitor whether or not we have the ability to actually accomplish those things. And I think that that system, when it gets out of whack, is what really kind of kicks in the anxiety and the depression and all of these things, where it's like our brain is convincing itself that it doesn't have the ability to go out in the world and to accomplish these things. Yeah. And actually that's interesting because there's this, I, I recently came across this finding that when we uh, accomplish something, or I think have some kind of positive experience, there's greater connectivity between areas of the default mode network and the uh, reward related areas, the wanting and liking mm -hmm. systems we were talking about earlier. So there, there can be this, um, this uh, kind of linking of these two networks. And, you know, I just, that was kind of, maybe that has to do with fulfilling those needs. And when they're not fulfilled and we're not having that, that connection between those networks, uh, perhaps there's these more negative intrusive thoughts telling us we need to go do something, get, get something. Um, but that's all speculation. That's all based off of my brief reading of finding. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like, and what you're getting at are the types of intrusive thoughts that a lot of people report with things like depression that are really more about like worthlessness and guilt and grief uh, that are about like what I'm not capable of. Um, and what really helps with a lot of that stuff is giving yourself small wins. Like you said, Andrew, like it's, it's allowing these, these parts of our brain to develop new connections, uh, to really kind of connect to the other regions and to say, look, I do have the ability. I do have kind of the, I just got, uh, uh, why does the default mode network generate creative solutions, ideas, and how can I consciously facilitate that occurrence? So we're actually kind of like at the end of, of time right now. I have some other stuff I have to get to. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, well, okay. I was just going to say, yeah. um, there's some interesting research on that about uh, why rest, why like spending time with your brain in that sort of default mode um, can uh, facilitate those, those creative solutions and ideas. Um, so if, if you are asking, uh, so first of all, I just recommend a book. It's called <laughs> rest. Uh, and I can't remember the author's name is Kim, Kim Sujung Pang. I can't remember. It's a, I think a Korean name, but um, the, uh, the, one of the parts he's talking about, there's this research on um, coming up with these creative ideas and how the default mode network is involved in kind of that aha moment. Um, but I would just say like, if you're asking how to consciously facilitate that occurrence, 
um, some of the research on creativity and even just on like productivity in general shows that like having periods of intense work, um, like really focused intense work followed by deep rest. Um, so just like getting out of that mode, going, doing something else, uh, resting, uh, can facilitate that kind of creativity. Um, I guess we don't really have time to get into all yeah. the neurophysiology, but yeah. I mean, I do want to say something because that, that is interesting. Uh, and it just kind of peaked something in what I was thinking about in terms of uh, a lot of what we just said about the default mode network was very negative, right? It was the, these intrusive thoughts and all, but you have to think about this as not being like the bad guy because the default mode network is also the reason why we're the most successful species on the planet. Uh, and when you're thinking about the brain being something that solves needs, right? I talked about psychological needs being the, the needs that create tension, create intrusive thoughts that are negative and things like that. But we also all the time create needs that are things that we're trying to look for creative solutions to. Right. And when we're not actively engaged in a task, our brain is working these things out. It's testing connections. It's doing all of these things. Um, and, and rest is a big part of that, of like uh, just letting things kind of randomly connect with one another. And I think that's what then leads to these kind of creative outbursts or whatever it may be. So it's not default mode bad. It's just that like you need to find balance with a lot of this stuff. And so I uh, we're I think we're we're like at time uh, we did yeah. get some other questions about habits about anesthesia about cerebral lysine that we didn't get to uh, we'll try to leave some resources that we found on these things uh, in the comments below uh, but thank you everyone for the engagement for kind of listening questions in the chat about the magic school bus and other things. <laughs> 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 but uh, it just, we really appreciate the engagement. We appreciate that people are tuning in and listening. And uh, I think I, I can't speak for Andrew, but I, I love doing this show. So, yeah, same here. Yeah, I, I love this. Thank you guys all for the questions. Um, as always, just uh, we, we really appreciate all your support just from watching and asking questions, commenting and everything. Um, but if you do get the chance, make sure to like and subscribe to both of our channels. Um, if you feel so inclined to help us keep this show going, um, check out our Patreon. The link is above Taylor's head, I think, uh, that QR code, um, uh, patreon.com slash the social brain. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I guess I'll just real quick uh, touch on this last question from Kat. She said, uh, <laughs> is Flow by Mihai, by Csikszentmihalyi, also a good book for that? Um the research, the neuroscience research on flow is uh, not there. mixed. Yeah, let's call it that. We have a, actually a whole episode where we dive into yeah. that and talk about it. Um, so, yeah, that book is probably great for talking about creativity and, and uh, flow states and everything, but from the psychological side. So just yep. keep that in mind. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We will see you for the next one. I think we're going to be talking about learning and memory and all that kind of stuff next time. So we'll see you for that. All right. We'll see you.